Welcome everybody. Here we are at our social determinants of information access exhibit. I'm going to be using a speakeasy script to demonstrate that if people with hearing loss came on this tour, they would be able to um, fully experience the exhibit without, you know, not hearing what it is I'm saying. So I'm going to use my speakeasy over here and get it started. It's right up here in the corner. Let's just make sure that it's refreshed. Okay, is my speakeasy working? There's our script. Looks like that's all set. Val, is there background there music or something? Sound? Um, Second let's see. Life? I'm not hearing any background sound. Is anybody else hearing any background sound here? Because Nellie says she hears some. My sound is off. So I'm not hearing any. Maybe I'm hearing somebody... birds and. Oh, let me turn off if there's any um, sounds. I'll turn that. Is that better? Yeah, it's gone. I also heard okay. drum, drumming. Sorry. Oh, 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 I bet there's, we do have some sounds all around this exhibit, but for Sorry. the recording, I'll turn those off. We have some drumming and different cultural sounds around. So, well, welcome everybody. We'll start now. Welcome to our community virtual library information exhibit in the sky, social determinants for access, for information access. And um, here we are above the Community Virtual Library main branch on Cookie Island. And we're going to be looking at various factors that restrict access to information, such as low income, the digital divide, race, gender, disabilities, all kinds of factors that, that contribute to information access. And I am really proud of the exhibitors and the amazing librarians and volunteers who work at the Community Virtual Library who put together this exhibit. Um, our curators for this exhibit are P. Ilios, Tamu O, Zoe Fudibu, Namara Makmara, and Gentle Heron. So these exhibitors share a lot of diversity themselves in their backgrounds, Latin American, Native American, African American, Asian American, and many just different diversity with a, a focus. Um, so if you want to take some pictures today, you can feel free to do that and you can email them to P. I'll put her email in the text chat. She is collecting a lot of pictures of this exhibit. So let's walk inside and we'll start in the uh, main entrance area here at the orientation area. I'll stand by the guest book. Visitors are encouraged to sign our guest book here. And um, you'll also see there's a wall that, that people can leave comments about the exhibit. And everything here is interactive, so you can click on things to get more information. And you can use your camera to zoom in as I am on the various signs that are around um, each of the rooms. I'll zoom in back here. Society is changing. And which factors are contributing to increased inequality in this exhibit? shares thoughts about ideas about the significance of the social and psychological issues of information access and how they might mitigate or exacerbate disparities. This particular room was created by P. Ilios. So she's a CVL volunteer librarian. She's a medical librarian in Puerto Rico. You can come back to this exhibit and explore later because we're just going to do an overview today. So the first place that I want you to walk is over into this room, which is the diversity research room. If you want, you can uh, take a seat around the table for just a minute. This is a great place to meet if people want to talk about all of these various factors that contribute to information access. And I'll show you that over here on the wall, you can click and uh, you can pick up, Zoe has offered a lot of different research articles, 
Um, when you're looking for learning opportunities on diversity, equity, and inclusion, you can click here for, for uh, research and suggestions. This room is curated by Zoe. Uh, she is also a librarian and volunteer at CBL and um, P. And as you're sitting here, you can also click and uh, on this table, you'll find a place to put an entry in our logbook. What are you reading? So it's a great place to talk about information in all formats, books, writing, reading, social media, all of the different ways that we communicate in digital culture. That note card gives examples of diversity and inclusion, including emphasis on decolonizing the catalog, which means making the library catalogs in libraries more equitable. In fact, our community virtual library librarians recently attended a webinar from the American Library Association on that topic. You can access the recording. I'll put it in the text chat. Uh, the Library of Congress is actually working on changing subject headings to make them more equal, um, equitable and more diverse. So you can come back later and click on the posters in the room to highlight research on these different topics, such as the digital divide and cultural heritage, which plays a role in information access. So for some examples of this, I'm gonna stand back up. As I told you, we're getting a great big overview today of everything at the um, exhibition. I'm gonna walk around here to Puerto Rico. And this room is also curated by P, who, as I said, is a librarian in Puerto Rico. I'm gonna stand under the begin to read here sign. <laughs> so you can kind of see uh, what there is to look at here in the Puerto Rico room. You can see that P has put the flavor of Puerto Rico in here and you can, and some storytellers, you can click on to hear their story. You can also click on this um, panel that says, click here to know more about a few Puerto Rican delights and to take with you a Rondon Q and Coquito bottle. <laughs> Sounds tasty. And there's more uh, information about Puerto Rico and research um, just to show you ways that you can place media into a virtual environment like this that's interactive. There's a lot of information about Puerto Rico in here. Okay, I'm gonna camera around here so you can see the begin to read here sign. You can look through all of these different posters. I like this sign, um, and I'll go stand by it, that shares self-identifying names as important to discuss how people want to be identified in cultural heritage. You can see this one. Populations in the United States that identify as having Latin American ancestry have used various labels to self-identify, including Latino, Latinx, Hispanic, Mexican American, Chicano, Puerto Rican, Cuban American, and, and among, among others. And I find that really interesting because nomenclature and language are essential to us all. And um, I have a friend who is um, has a Latin American cultural heritage. And I was confused by which one of these terms to use with her and her sisters. And she explained to me, you know what? She said, Val, you can just ask because her sisters came from LA and um, they preferred a different term than she did who grew up in Texas. And so um, if you just ask, there's nothing embarrassing about asking, what's the best term for your cultural heritage? And so I was glad to hear that it's fine to just ask. So we're gonna move around to the next room. Uh, this is also P's room here um, and this room, I personally find a, a fascinating room and one that's important teaching students in digital culture. It's the room of bias, I like to call it. And um, when I talk about bias, confirmation bias is something that we all encounter online and you really can't get away from it. 
Um, and it's important, I think, for students to be aware of it. And so I'll move down this way into the room of, of confirmation bias. So what is confirmation bias? When you think about it, we all create our personal dashboards on our computers. We decide what information is coming to us every day on social media, even if it's educational sites, um, what courses that we want to interact with. We set up our dashboards however we choose. And that wasn't so years and years ago. You had only so much information to choose from. So when you choose your dashboard on your iPad or Kindle or desktop or laptop or whatever device you're using, it's just inherent that you pick what pleases you and you often choose what you agree with. But since we don't learn in isolation, we learn in collision with other people's ideas, it's important that we don't just follow people who think exactly like we do, or we will fall victims of confirmation bias. Now up above this room, um, we've created a new exhibit and this one I've been working on myself. So I'm gonna cam up. Um, P, I don't think P's here yet. And P's working on a teleporter to make it real easy to click and pop upstairs. But I'm gonna just take my camera and zoom in up above us. And when I do in the room above us, let's see. Oh, I have to walk. Sorry, it's not under the confirmation room. It's over this way. Stand by the food table. It'll be a little easier. I'm going to pop up to a chair upstairs and I can teleport you all up there. Or you can, if you sit in the chair upstairs, you'll be able to TP your own self up. There's some book chairs. I'm going to sit on that book chair. Oh, Namara beat me. You're real good at this. I guess I'm just not close enough to my chair. We'll get up there. Don't worry. <laughs> and this is going to be the room of bias. Let's see if Namara, can you TP me up there? It's like we're, we've got to get our teleporter to, teleporter to work up here, and then we'll see if uh, we can get people upstairs easily. Oh, Zoe's found the teleporter. Okay, where's Zoe? Zoe's right here. There it is. We found the teleporter. We can click on that. Let's see if we can teleport to the upstairs. Oh, there we are, we're upstairs. Thank you, Zoe. <laughs> Virtual worlds are, uh, are interesting ways to uh, move around and interact and sometimes you get stuck somewhere. So there's a good example. So thank you for, for helping out. This is our, our newest exhibit room and it's on the concept of digital legacy. So um, I wanna ask you all, does anybody know what I mean by digital legacy? Feel free to use text or vo voice and I'm gonna walk back here and stand by one of the exhibit posters. What do you think digital legacy is all about? Anybody? Voice is fine, chat is fine. I'm gonna zoom in on this. This is the big clue for digital legacy. What happens to your virtual world assets when you pass away? And by virtual world assets, I am including what happens to all of your digital content, all of the photos on your picture of your family, all of your social media accounts that you've placed a lot of photos and things like that. Digital legacy is a huge and expanding industry, actually. And um, I think it's important for all of us to, con to start thinking about it um, because our physical and our virtual memories are equally important. And Facebook now um, has legacy contacts. Um, you can choose somebody to be able to uh, access your information after you die and uh, access your account so it can be memorialized should you choose to do that. Many other social media sites and companies are doing the same. Here's a picture of the community virtual library and we were talking after one of our tours about information access on this topic. And so here's a photo of us in that space talking about archiving our virtual experiences. Someone's asking me for a TP, so I will TP her over here. Marley Melina. So here we are talking about our digital legacy. And um, I'll just show a couple more things about that as we move to the next area. Virtual assets are real. 
they're just as real as physical ass assets. In fact, in digital culture, most of our content is born digital. So we really need to be thinking about digital le legacy and archival or a lot of our information could be lost in the future. In fact, some people fear we could enter the digital dark ages. So this room is just a brief overview of the problems that we face in the future and many pre presentations could stem from this idea. Virtual world connections are also real. I'm gonna ask the people that are standing around me here, these virtual avatars, how many of you have colleagues in this world that you're just as close to as people in the physical world? And yeah, Peona, Peonia mentions black data, um, the dark web, data that we that's lost, we cannot archive. Uh, they're saying definitely. I have people here in the virtual world that I know as well as any physical world friend or um, colleague that I've worked to worked with for years because this is a real space, even though it is virtual. So we can talk about digital legacy um, at other presentations and perhaps perhaps do a whole presentation on digital legacy and archival. The archivist of the United States, David Ferriero, he recently said in a webinar that this is what keeps him up at night, thinking about the archival of the future of all of our virtual and digital assets. Okay, I'm standing by the teleporter board so we don't get lost. If everybody wants to come and click on the teleporter board here and just choose teleport, click on it and we'll go back downstairs. All right, great. And we're going to head over to Tamu's room. If you get lost, you can also ask me for a, tel uh, a TP, just IM me. Let's go back through the main orientation room to the African American Studies room. So many presentations could come from the topics that I'm introducing to you today. And each one of our curators, you can contact later if you want more information on a particular um, topic. So this room was created by Tamu O. Oh. She's an African-American studies professor at Ohio State University. You can use your camera to zoom in on a lot of the content that she has here um, on African-American studies, um, racial inequity, different um, policies on uh, anti-racism. She also has a YouTube channel and uh, you can come in here later and uh, get access to a lot of her information that she shares online. There's another teleporter that will take you, I'll zoom in on it here by the door, take you upstairs to Tammy's, Tamu's upstairs area, where she um, shares some information about the digital divide and how access to, to um, information um, on our hardware, the internet, connectivity and the digital divide is a, is a huge issue for um, inter information access. All right, so now we're gonna walk out this way. You can always come back here and look around more and interact with the, the research articles that you can click on if there's a particular area that's, that interests you. Initially, this exhibit was a summer fair and the park was all decked out for summer with balloons and festivities. Well, virtual worlds are dynamic spaces that can be changed, that can be kept fresh and alive. And now it's fall here in the physical world. And so P has brought autumn into the virtual world so that it's not a stagnant ghost town where nothing is happening. <laughs> and that's what makes this very interactive. We'll walk around this way and you'll see that there's a beautiful park where people can meet and, and share and discuss things. And uh, we're gonna walk, well, maybe we'll walk through the park this time, it's so pretty. We're gonna walk through the park back to the racial diversity, diversity area. I mean, no, that um, gender diversity space. And look, there's so many beautiful fall things here. I can practically smell it in the air. <laughs> We'll walk through the beautiful falling leaves back to the gender diversity area. We have some storytelling NPC characters. Non-player characters are a great way to share information uh, virtually. And Namara helped the librarians here learn how to create these 
NPC storytellers. So I'm going to let Namara tell us a bit about um, the gender diversity area of the exhibit and a little bit about these NPC storytelling characters. Namara? Yes, um, I'm assuming everybody can hear me because I have the green above my head. Um, I also have a... Uh, yes, great. Okay, so... There we go. Um, I want to um, thank everybody for being here, for being part of MOOC, for having the opportunity to share these ideas. Um, just real quick, you know, gender sounds like it's a simple thing, male, female, right? Well, um, it's, it's so much more than that. It's so much more than one or the other. Uh, think of it as a spectrum, right? Um, depending on context, the associated characteristics that define gender may include our biological sex, sex-based social structure, or gender identification. Gender is one of the things we use for social organization, um, just like categorizing parts of this exhibit so that things make sense for us. Um, too often, though, it's, it's just a binary male-female perspective of gender, and that's what's most commonly used to assign or associate social roles and, and expectations. Right, Marley's absolutely right. Um, exploring the implications and impact of gender identity is what we hope this part of the exhibit is meant to do. And the storytellers are a way of engaging you. Um, and we invite you to think about and learn more about gender, okay? Even when you're not here, just to think about it because it's so important to the way we interact with each other. The storytellers that we've used here um, share information and even a little contextual story to help you better understand a broader perspective of gender. So briefly, our gender identity and how we manifest that identity in the world around us can either open doors or slam them shut. So my attire in Second Life isn't much different than in real life. And over the years, that's been an issue. Often um, access to housing, uh, employment, appropriate health care, uh, among a host of other things, have been denied me because of assumptions that are made. You know, speaking of assumptions, I'd like to share uh, a quick anecdote. It may sound like it's going to be off color, but it's not, all right? I was asked by a physician, this is like many, many moons ago, if I was sexually active. Of course, at the time I said yes. Well, I mean, I said yes. Uh, and he asked me if I used birth control. I said no. And he replied, you know what they call women who don't use birth control? And I said no, because I just wasn't thinking. He said no, and he said parents. I wanted to say or lesbians, but I didn't. And needless to say, it was my last visit to that particular physician. Um, I just as an aside, I do, um, I've interviewed my physicians ever since. And if we don't on that first consultation click, I'll shop for another one. Um, so those who want their uh, gender or sexual orientation respected are simply asking for the same uh, courtesies that you would extend anyone else. And this exhibit hopefully shares a little bit to get you thinking about how to properly and respectfully um, address those who are not on the male-female gender uh, expectation. All right, so that brings us to pronouns real quick. And there are going to be times when you find yourself in a situation where you want to respect someone's gender identity that is clearly different from their assigned birth, gender, or sex. Just like you want to be respectful of someone's cult cultural heritage, we want to be respectful in these, this context as well. You'll see preferred pronouns in uh, email signatures, uh, SL profiles, right? 
even some LinkedIn profiles, convention name tags, Vitas, and, and a whole host of other platforms or, or situations. So using someone's preferred gender pronouns is the best way to show respect to someone in terms of gender identity. Okay, um, you may be aware that there are many cultures that honor those who are outside the sex-based gender role. For example, indigenous people of North America have a gender category for people who manifest both male and female gender traits. They're called two-spirit. Two-spirit is a religious and sacred gender designation, so it shouldn't be used you know, outside of its cultural context. I could go on forever. I won't. Hopefully you'll take the information in the sandwich board to learn more and to enjoy the storytellers as well. Come back and visit and um, that's pretty much it on, on my end. Thank you. Thank you, Namara. This is, this is just showing so many different ways that we need to think about information and communication. Um, and so we're gonna head over this way. I think I might just turn my sound back on just so you can see that what in Second Life, you can also, you'll hear some drums going as we walk by them. See if you hear that. This is part of the, the food and some of the African um, studies experience that Tamu O has put out back here. So, you know, you can use sound, you can use food, you can use a lot of different things about culture uh, as we share in a virtual space. Turn my sound back down and let's head around this way. You'll find more different kinds of diverse foods as you're walking along and more storytellers. Now, I mentioned that Namara helped the librarians learn about making the storytellers. You know, we all learn so much from each other using these virtual and digital tools. I'm learning from Nelly, who is currently the one who's streaming this to YouTube, um, you know, and it took a lot of people working together to create this exhibit. Uh, my curators, some people love to build, P loves to decorate, you know, there's lots of different ways that we can contribute and help each other. I think I'm hearing voice a little bit. Let's see. I'm going to let Zoe share a bit about her experience creating the storytellers. Zoe, can you um, tell us a bit about the storytellers and, and what you've done here? Sure. Sorry. I was just uh, testing my voice because I always <laughs> I always have issue with it. Um, let's see. All right. Great to see everyone. I'm so glad you all are here so we can share this time and space together. Um, speak easy going all right so one of my primary interests uh, both in real life and second life is oral history i really love storytelling memoirs and biographies um and i'm originally from hawaii and back home you'll often hear the phrase let's talk story or let's go talk story let's talk story with each other and when we use this phrase um, it's often used to create a space for sharing knowledge and for sharing wisdom. Um, we ask questions, we encourage dialogue. It's one of the critical ways that we um, foster connections between our histories and our ideas and the values that we share. And as you think of your own communities, um, you probably have your own term that kind of embodies this talk story idea, um, and you can go ahead and share that in the chat if you like. Okay. And so, as, uh, as we started planning for this exhibit back in spring, I really wanted to bring a bit of that talk story spirit or um, storytelling spirit into this space. And as we know, the knowledge and wisdom that we share using the um, methods of our ancestors hold just as much value as an article published in a scholarly journal or a chapter in a book. And the collective wisdom that resides in the voices of our community, people who, you know, may not hold academic titles and not perform professors, they don't maybe have, you know, impressive credentials, but they still have important insights to share and critical guidance to offer. And so I spent a few days interviewing three people in real life to talk story with them 
about um, the information that they need and the various ways that they fulfill those needs. And so those are the interviews that are available here in this exhibit that we're, that we're touring today. And the transcripts of these interviews were lightly edited for readability since I knew I'd be sharing them in text format here in Second Life. And during my travels across the vid, the grid, excuse me, I'd been noticing these static low-prim characters in other communities and wanted to figure out how to share my interviews using them. And luckily, we have Namara, as Val mentioned earlier, and so she helped us um, get all our storytellers set up. And um, she helped with both the technical aspect and also just um, kind of putting to get putting together a natural way of having them tell the different stories that we wanted to share. Um, and so as you move through the exhibit, you'll encounter these NPCs or static characters. These are our storytellers. Um, so you can just click on each storyteller to hear their story. And the NPCs that are gathered around the ice cream carts near the park have longer stories. Um, these are our RO interviews with everyday people who are talking about their information needs and the challenges that they faced in fulfilling them. And you can see, let's see, I feel like my storyteller is not catching up with my, <laughs> with my talking. Anyway, um, so first here on my right, we have Mrs. Agbayani in the white shirt, and she recently retired. Um, and lives alone, and she often searches the internet for information about wellness for older adults, but she sometimes struggles to find the answer she seeks because the results she retrieves are sometimes irrelevant. She's not sure what she's doing wrong, and she blames herself. Next we have in the uniform, we have Jeff. He has a plethora of devices, he has easily access to information via the internet, and because of this, he feels he doesn't need library or librarians at all. He's mistaken! <laughs> and finally, we have Mitzi in the blue shirt and white shorts, and she's a graduate student who is curious about virtual worlds, but has no way of accessing Second Life because the laptop is too basic to load virtual worlds. And so, she also expresses, expresses um, frustration about content and networking opportunities that are locked behind P walls. So um, that's just kind of a taste of all three of the interviews that are available. Um, but there's a large stand labeled notes uh, between all of the storytellers to my right. And this is the, um, the Container that holds the um, Google Docs to the full interviews. So hopefully that makes for easy. We just click and then access the full interviews that way. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, be sure to visit all the storytellers, uh, both inside the building and around the park. All of the baristas and folks serving treats also have stories and information to share too. So let's see. Thanks so much, um, Zoe. Uh, and we'll have a little time to share when we get down below uh, about what you think about all of these different ways to share stories and access information. So we're going to um, end the tour going down below. We have a couple more exhibits down at the main branch of the library. Be thinking if, if there's a part of this exhibit that you're really excited or interested to learn more about, we could certainly schedule a presentation to dig deeper into any particular um, focus that you've seen here. So here's the Second Life URL. We're gonna head down below and see Gentle Heron's exhibit on hidden disabilities. Uh, I'll meet you there. If you just click on that, um, on that Second Life URL in the text chat, we'll head to the Community Virtual Library main branch down below. See you there. I'm going to ask you to follow me and walk over to the path. Music comes on here, so you might have to just turn it off. And I'm going to step right over here. If you can't hear me, step over here by the arrows. This is Gentle Heron's Hidden Disabilities Exhibit, which some of you may have, have seen. It was part of the Second Life birthday celebration this year. 
And this exhibit certainly aligns to social determinants for access to information. As you go around this exhibit, you click on the red circles and you will see hidden disabilities that one might have that you don't even know. You might not be aware that someone has a disability. So I'm gonna click on one just for example, stuttering, can't see it. And then some people do not have a hidden disability. And certainly hidden disabilities are part of information access. If you're, un if you're unable to hear, for example, or um, if you have uh, some type of uh, you know, hyperactive um, disorder that makes it difficult for you to focus. And I really like showing this particular exhibit because it shows such a creative way to present the content. As librarians, with all of these tools at our fingertips, we're trying to achieve the best practices in displaying information like this. And uh, certainly a virtual world gives you a lot of creative ways. Uh, the fisherman way back around here, he's in the pond and uh, he has hearing loss, you can't tell. Uh, and so what an what a interesting way to interact with information by clicking and uh, being immersed in this kind of a, of a display. Um, we also have a new part. If you've been at this, if you've seen this before, you may not have seen our new exhibit. If you'll follow me to the over to the right of the library, follow me this way, and I'll show you a new part of our exhibit. If you can't hear me, just move closer. This is our newest part of the exhibit. We were talking, um, Namara and I were talking one day and uh, we made a typo in our instant message in the chat log. And we were talking about how easy it is to make typos and to you know, have um, autocorrect mistakes that can be hilarious and how language is changing. And that also impacts our access to information and communication. So we did a presentation here for the MOOC called Grammar Cops, talking about the various registers of language and how you don't speak to your children the same way you speak to your boss. <laughs> talking about changing grammar and the emphasis that used to be on you know, the red pen, perfect grammar. And now we have emojis as part of our language. And we have a lot of um, changing linguistics linguistics due to the internet. Namara and I will be doing a presentation here on this Friday for the nonprofit commons as grammar cops dressed in our virtual grammar cop police uniforms with our virtual digital whistles. <laughs> so it's kind of a tongue in cheek, a fun way to think about changing grammar. So this too could lead to a lot of um, presentations on language and, and literature and the importance of deep reading and critical thinking in a culture where we scroll, delete, scroll, delete, app, app, app so fast all day long. So um, we're all, we'll, from here, we're going to, um, we're gonna move over to the main branch library to go inside and talk some more and, and de debrief. Uh, but I wanted to show you the two, the, the, that our information access exhibit is adding more content. Uh, so now we have the sky exhibit, but we also have some information exhibits down here below. And also Namara has placed some storyteller characters that um, tell their stories about changing literacy down here. Namara, do you wanna say anything else about the grammar cops before we move inside? I was just going to say that it's this is a really fun and engaging way to look at language use. And I think that if you haven't seen um, the grammar cops in action, you need to be around on on Friday when we do it again. Thanks. That's yes. It. 
Thanks. It, it was really fun and engaging. And, and a lot of people, I think, we were so excited to see that people care about grammar. We thought nobody would show up. But people are interested in the fact that, you know, what are people going to be, what's language going to be in five or 10 years with the fast pace we live in? People want to really contemplate that. Um, it's, a, it's a really important topic. So um, we're going to move into the main branch and I'll meet you at the reference desk. Follow me. I'll wait for people to join me in here. Sometimes when you cross the parcel lines, the voice might cut out. So I'll, I'll wait till everybody gathers around me here at the reference desk. And then we'll continue talking about information access and, um, and just virtual world um, education. So during our first tours that we did over the summer, this was only going to be a summer exhibit up in the sky, but it was so well received. When we came down here and people got talking, they really wanted more. And they said, don't take it away, keep the exhibit. So we changed it to, you know, to um, a permanent exhibit in the sky and we began to add content to it. We plan to continue this exhibition and present it at the Virtual World's Best Practices in Education Conference in the spring of 2022, which should most likely take place in March. So I hope that all of my exhibitors that are here today will kind of continue thinking about their part and what they want to, to share and um, at the uh, at the conference. Um, uh, and yes, Existential is saying, shouldn't millennials and Zoomers do the emoji talk? Uh, great point. I love to study the different generations and how they communicate and interact with information differently. And so I think that would be a really cool talk to bring different generations of people to talk about the way they communicate. Um, so good point there. We're at our reference desk, and I want to point out that thanks to uh, Zoe learning from Namara about these NPC characters, meet John Librarian. He's, he's the man standing behind the reference desk so that if one of the librarians is not on duty here, and we would love to have a, li a librarian from around the world on duty at this desk 24 seven, seven days a week, all hours of the day. But right now we, we don't have someone all the time. Sometimes there's not a librarian on duty, but you can click on John and he will welcome you to the community virtual library, give you some information, tell you about our website and, uh, and things like that. And uh, all of these, a lot of our things are interactive here. You click on the bell. And if there's a librarian in world, a librarian will come and help that patron with whatever question they might have. Um, the web, a lot of our tools are interactive. The old card catalog, which is the tip of the hat to traditional libraries of the past, that takes you to our holdings in this library, as well as our, um, our database. We have uh, landmarks throughout Second Life. We have Jan Loria's amazing collection of simulations across Second Life. We've got a lot of things in here that help with access to information. And our goal is in digital culture, people get so lost online and they feel isolated, but we want to provide a real person here to help people interact with information because people we believe are more important than data. We have a world literature board that helps people with um, various uh, cultures and languages. And I wanna invite you all to come in and take a seat in our main reading room so that we can open up a bit of conversation about information in the digital age. So come on in and take a seat. And while you're getting settled, I want to point out that I love this room because it's, a tip of the hat to the beautiful libraries throughout history where one might go in and peruse the stacks. As a child, I remember moving into the philosophy section and asking myself, what is that? What is philosophy? And I would stumble upon these amazing concepts as I wandered the library. We don't do that online. We have to search with words. And then when those words come out, we don't really stumble upon new things. We just are led from hypertext link to hypertext link. 
It's a different world. But this room reminds us of libraries of the past. So here we are sitting in a beautiful library, contemplating what is information in the future. So I'm gonna ask you about your feedback here and what, what this makes you think about. How is information changing? What problems do you see with this fast pace that we live in? And is this exhibit an example of education in virtual worlds that sparks your interest, your curiosity, you find useful? So I'm gonna open up the floor. You can use text chat here and feel free to use voice. I like that existential just popped out a really cool chair. <laughs> oh, it's Tez. Yeah, I took off name tags here so for the video so I don't see all the names above you. Oh, thank you for not burning down the library, Tess. <laughs> I'm also going to put in the text chat a link to our first tour. It's a little edited short video. If, you're, if you want to share with anyone what this CBL information exhibit is all about, this is the video from our tours in the summer. And we had um, people bring up questions, comments about changing literacy, about the problems that, you know, that we have with, um, with changing language. Some people are concerned about kids not learning handwriting, just typing, and the development of the brain when they're growing up online, and not so much emphasis on deep reading of print and focus on literature. Do any of you have concerns about changing literacy and information access? Phil, it, I just want to jump in real quick. This is Namara. You, you were talking about um, literacy, digital information access. And I think that um, when we have traditional libraries that those that more people had access to things and granted you know geographically it depends on what's in the library etc but um, I think about online information whether it's vetted or not in that is it credible um, if I'm economically or geographically um, unable to access information um, it's it's not as easy online, uh, I think, for for certain groups, and I could be mistaken, but this is my perception, if you will, on on accessing all of that. And I and I didn't mean to just use voice, and I, but the things just came to me about who has the opportunity and access, and and compared to those who don't, and what kind of information they have access to digitally versus not digitally. I'm, I just feel like a lot of the stuff that's available to us digitally is not as credible as maybe some of the things that we had access to uh, in, a, in a more traditional, if you will, format. That's a great point, Namarov. And that's librarians are trained to curate the highest quality, accurate and aesthetically pleasing materials for specific communities say I was a school librarian, and it was for that particular community. Online, everything is chaotic. You'll get 50 million hits on something. And sometimes you'll go to a really slick looking website. It's created by a 12 year old middle schooler, you know, and it, who knows where, where any of the content came from. Um, so it, it is, you can get so lost online. And I've, I've often heard that that is the challenge of librarians today is to not teach students how to go and find a book. It's to teach them how to evaluate the millions of hits they're getting online. So um, librarians are still needed. And I, I do think you're right that there was a plus to having gatekeepers in the past. Those gatekeepers filtered out all the nonsense for us. And now part of digital citizenship is we have to be the gatekeeper ourselves. We have to filter out all the nonsense and not get sidetracked by hyperlink after hyperlink. 
what other concerns do you all have that sitting in this traditional looking library remind you? And of course, you know, information um, access, we, we can't avoid the fact that most of us right now have really good technology, good internet, a good graphics card, or we wouldn't be sitting in this beautiful virtual library. And there are people who live out in the country that could not possibly do this. They don't even have good internet. So that's a huge stumbling block. Did any of the other, um, we brought a lot of subjects into um, information access today in, in various ways. Any of them stand out to you? What did you like about the exhibit? Was there something that made you feel, yes, that is something that's important? Voice or text chat? And I see ex existential is saying, if you don't spend enough time in academia, many probably don't know that Facebook memes aren't credible or a minimum is terribly skewed information. Absolutely. Social media has really brought challenges to accuracy of information and a lot of confirmation bias. And Zari is saying, I think the exhibit about critical thinking and bias is an important food for thought topic for visitors. Yeah, and I think, you know, Zri, that is really the bottom line of this entire thing. And Namara pointed that out in our Grammar Cop session. It's not about being correct. It's about good thinking. Reading is about thinking. Information access is about critical thinking. It's not about finding a pretty picture or a cute little cat. You know, that's fun. And there's nothing wrong, wrong with fun. But critical thinking is the bottom line to learning and information. And so teaching how to think is, more, is the most important thing. And how to think for yourself. You know, it's a, and also in this room, I, I like to point out that we are in a real place together here. We're not on a website just looking at this information and reading about, oh, the world is changing and we have some problems and we need to be digital citizens. Reading that isn't, it's just not the same as us, us being together in a place, really thinking about it and talking about it together. So do you feel like you're in a real place sitting here together? And so he's saying, I do with real people. And there's that sense of presence that we have and creating a real memory of the space that you're sitting in and the people that are around you and the conversation that, that they're sharing. Which I wanna point out is different than a Zoom window. And um, you know we're recording this through a Zoom window, but there's not a sense of being together in a Zoom window. There's a sense of being separate in whatever background that person has chosen. Um, and you're not actually in a shared space. And that's what Zoe was saying at the same moment. <laughs> and existential says, I feel like I'm with people. The space feels like a giant chat room with 3D graphics my brain is, ne is never not aware of this fact. Ooh, that's an interesting thing. How, how, you know, if you've been in Second Life for a long time, I sort of let go of the environment around me and I'm just in it and it's just real. But it, it took a little while to feel that way. How about any of you? Do you feel like you're actually in the space? I just let go of the fact that the, there's a physical room around me and I'm, I'm in this virtual space. And, um, you know, with, with headsets on the horizon, virtual reality headsets, I have one. I do not like it. It, it makes me feel very claustrophobic and, and it's uh, no tools at my fingertips. Uh, all of this will become more and more um, mainstream, available, the idea that we can be in a virtual space. 
there's no going away. I think uh, we need to think about the best practices for that in the near future. And the, the conversation is how many years you all have been in Second Life? A lot of you, 13 years. Yes, it took, it takes a while to get really used to it. And then you just, you're just in it. Oh, P is here. Welcome. P is one of our amazing exhibitor uh, curators here. In fact, this all was P's idea initially. So we're really glad to have you come, P. We're just wrapping up our Zoom session, which is being live streamed on YouTube. We shared all of the exhibit in the sky. So um, P, feel free to say a few words if you'd like about the exhibit. And thank you for making it all um, autumn. <laughs> it was a summer exhibit and now fall is in the air. So we've been kind of wrapping up our our time at the exhibit here, talking about um, information access. And um, Stranger points out, I know people who are more immersive. I'm not sure what you mean by that, if you want to um, elaborate, um, because just the word immersive, you know, we all we are immersed here, embodied, so to speak, with an avatar, avatar inside the space. Right yeah, take, go uh, ahead. Thank you. Actually, I can't think of her name right now. There's a lady who for, for a long time has been giving lectures in SL on uh, on that whole thing about presence and whatnot in the in the world and uh, immersive is sort of what you were talking about the degree of uh, to which you are uh, in the world you know that you feel hmm? Yes. That it's real, you know, what's around you and whatnot. It's uh she she when one part of her lecture she actually takes a hammer in her hand and goes over to someone and someone she knows it's will be okay with and whacks them with a the hammer, you know. And she'll say some people would really be disturbed by that, you know. That would be an example, you know, whether you're disturbed by him. Oh. Other people might just laugh, you know, what the hell, you know, it's not a real hammer, you know, it's like. Oh, good point, yes. Excellent point, yes. Um, you, can, you can experience something, and like in VR, you know, you're falling off of a building, it could be really upsetting to people. Uh, so yes, there is, there is that blend between the physical and the virtual and it feeling absolutely real. Good point. I, I know one, I knew one person who was confronted by a griefer who was just, you know, kind of punching and kicking at her, you know, pushing her along, hmm? pushed her a long way. Hmm? And uh, she was so traumatized. She was not gonna, you know, she was saying, I'm never coming back to ASL. She did end up staying, but you know, but she was, hmm? feel like she had to leave SL because of uh, Yes. And it never occurred to her all she had to do was t TP away, you know, <laughs> that, that guy, you know, <laughs> it was that simple to get away from him, but. Hmm? Exactly. I remember taking a griefer class when I first came in world, given by a librarian. And she said, you can always teleport away or just log out. You know, but yeah, and you you just kind of forget that when you're, you know, when you really feel like it's real. And Peona, Peonia suggests it's like walking into the light after being in the dark. If you want to elaborate on that, Peonia, that's an interesting little way of of putting it because you have to get used to the world, you know. And it, it took me about six weeks of wrapping my head around the virtual world.
And we're getting close to the top of the hour. I want to thank you all for being part of this virtual world MOOC 21. It's it's really been an amazing opportunity. I'm so thankful to be a part of it, where Nellie is um, organizing this and Peonia here and among others, and sharing it through YouTube to archive where education is at this particular moment in time and all of the tools that we are learning and juggling and and striving to understand how information is changing. And it takes all of us working together to, to understand this and move forward and, and learn from each other. 